Verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here, and that, of course, is Jonah, the queen of the south, that would be the queen of Sheba, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. This is incredible. Jesus is talking about the people of Nineveh standing in judgment against the scribes and the Pharisees of the day. He's talking about the Queen of Sheba standing in judgment against the scribes and the Pharisees of the day because they are more righteous than them. If we go back into the Old Testament and we learn about these people, they didn't seem like very righteous people. But at some point in time, repentance took place, and we can particularly focus on Nineveh and a little bit about the history of Nineveh. These people were as hedonistic, as backwards, as barbaric as you could possibly imagine. There are some historical records that actually talk about them committing types of uh, atrocities such as such as mass crucifixions, and not the Roman-style crucifixions with the T-shaped cross, but the X-shaped cross, which had been around for quite some time. In fact, if you're not aware of this, the word crucifixion is the root word from where we get the word excruciating. And the Ninevites were just, uh, they, were, they were a godless people. And in fact, they were so godless and so feared that when Jonah went there, that was the reason why he tried not to go there when God called him to go there, because he was afraid. And not only was he afraid to go there, but he was also angry. He did not want them to repent. He actually didn't want them to repent. If you read Jonah carefully, you'll see that Jonah, he, had, he felt no remorse for them. He felt no, I should say, felt no compassion for them. Because he felt they were going to feel no remorse for their lifestyle and their behavior. Well, when he did finally get tossed out of the belly of the whale, I'll just put it politely, up onto the seashore, and he did make his way to Nineveh, and he did go into town, and he did start preaching the word of God, and he did start prophesying what God had in store. Lo and behold, the whole city repented. It just shows you that we don't know what God has in store, but if God calls us to do something, we need to step out by faith and do what he's called. We're just the messengers. We're just the vessel that he's using to deliver the message. If God were sending out mail, you and I would be the envelope, and the Holy Spirit would be the stamp. And we're just empowered to go out there and to deliver that message, and then the Lord is responsible for taking care of the rest. What an opportunity Jonas had to be blessed, and in the end he ended up being miserable anyway. Poor Jonah. An interesting fella, depressed fella, a fella who still had trouble focusing his priorities but a fellow nonetheless who was used of God to deliver a very powerful message. Yes, Nineveh did go back into their hedonistic ways. Yes, Nineveh did fall in the not-too-distant future after having repented, but it showed how mightily God can change the will of an entire people through one man. And then later on, Jesus himself would use Jonah as an illustration. Fascinating. It also kind of puts an end to the argument of, was Jonah really swallowed by a whale or by a great fish of some sort? The answer is yes, he was. Otherwise, Jesus would not have recognized him for who he was, being three days and three nights in the belly of the whale or the great fish. Verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out, and when he is come in, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so, it shall be also unto this wicked generation. 
Oh my, that seems like a little bit of a cryptic message, but as you look through it, what happens is a person here has an issue. The person sheds that one issue and everything's clean. Everything's straightened out, so to speak. What they decide to do now is they decide to make righteousness. They decide to make holiness in their own image. Some people say, we make God in our own image. Some people foolishly say that. What their focus is, is their focus is that we make our own righteousness. And, of course, that's foolish because then, you know, where's the foundation of morality? Where's the foundation of truth? Where's the foundation of right and wrong? You have none of that. If we look in Scripture, we find the foundation for all of those things. God gave us those things. Here we have a person who had a belief, got rid of that belief because it was wrong. Everything was cleaned out. Then they start manufacturing a new belief. And after a time, the manufacturing of the belief kind of takes on a life of its own. Today we would call that a movement. The Lord Jesus says when a person does this, they become far more wicked than they were the first time around. In other words, if they had just addressed the issue and turned to the Lord and allowed the Lord to do the cleansing and then followed the Lord, why then their lives would be in faith, in righteousness. Remember, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. The just shall live by faith. This appears four times in Scripture. This is something that's very important. And this is something that they were completely neglecting because he's illustrating exactly what they had done. They had taken the Old Testament law. They realized they couldn't keep the Old Testament law, so they swept it away. And then they came back and they rewrote it in such a way that they could keep it, but now it was seven times worse, or we'll just say many times worse, and it had basically excluded God completely. And that's basically what Jesus is saying in this passage. It's not a good thing. And the way he closes it out is he says, even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. He's talking to them. Now, this is not a way to win friends and influence people, but it is the way to tell the truth. And that's the only thing Jesus knows how to do, is tell the truth. Now, as Jesus is talking here in verse 46, a very interesting thing happens, and we need to watch this, because this shows us how important fellowship in Christ is. This shows us how important we all are to each other in Christ and to Christ as the body of the church. Verse 46, while he yet talked to the people, so this is while that discussion is still going on, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. As you're listening to this message in Matthew chapter 12, and as we close out this chapter, realize that when you do the will of the Father, when you accept Christ as Lord and Savior, when you agree to yield to Him, to follow Him, to take up your cross, to deny yourself daily, to follow Him faithfully, to learn of Him, to be more like Him, to love others in His name, and to share His gospel, that you are joint heirs with Him to all the riches in heaven that this earth has nothing to offer you in comparison. You are my brother, you are my sister, you are my mother and my father. You are closer to me than anyone that would be close to me by blood. We are all a precious family in Christ Jesus. And that explains to us why loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves is indeed the greatest of all commandments and why these commandments are the anchor upon which all of the law and all of the prophets were once placed.